Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Miss Lisa and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about everything that I want to that is science and math. And today we are talking about physical science and chemical reactions. So if you didn't watch the last couple of videos, you might need to go do those first. So, what's a chemical reaction? Now, normally what I do in class is I light a match. And I say, is this a chemical change or a physical change? When you get through with what happens, do you still have the wood, the chemical in the end, and is there any way to easily get it back? No, it's a chemical change, not a physical change. If you boil water, then that's a, a, a physical change. It's still H2O. You can get it back. You can chill it, and it turns back into liquid water again. So, um, chemical reactions are when compounds or elements in compounds um, break and form chemical bonds. So you're not going to have water anymore, H2O, you're going to have something new. Maybe you're going to get H2O2 and have peroxide. So you're making new things. The and chemical reactions are what I do as a chemist, as a chemistry teacher, I'm always making chemical reactions. And so they, when I do this, it's sort of a lot like cooking because I go into my lab and I make things that then my students can use and um, I follow recipes. But instead of the recipes being like a cup of sugar, a cup of butter, stuff like that, it is written as a chemical equation. That's how my recipes are written. And um, I can read that by weighing stuff out. I usually use my scale. Sometimes I use the graduated cylinder and get the volume. But I figure out how much of it the chemicals, I combine them. Sometimes they need a condition of the reaction, like they have to be heated or um, you have a catalyst added. We'll, add, we'll talk about what those things mean. But anyway, these are recipes. And when I teach this in chemistry class, I explained to them that chemistry, that cooking actually is chemistry. That when you um, cook something in the oven, bonds are being broken, bonds are being formed, and you're getting a new thing. And you can realize that, like, would it, if you make a cake, would it be very easy to get the eggs back and the, the milk back and the flour back? No, you couldn't, because now it's something new. It undergoes a chemical reaction. Um, and there's shows now out that really talk about the chemistry of cooking. I've heard um, Alton Brown. I haven't watched him, but I've heard that his cooking show talks about the chemistry of cooking a lot. So when these, um, when you write a recipe, you have a list of ingredients, and then it tells you what to do. In chemistry, we don't do that. We write, it, it looks like, almost like a math problem. You'll have one chemical plus another chemical, then an arrow, and then some more chemicals. Well, the chemicals that are on your left hand, when you put your hand down on the paper, um, those are called the reactants. They're the ingredients. And what they produce, what you make, are called the products. And they are um, added together. So you put plus symbols in between them. Now, they have to follow a law. And the law is the conservation of mass and energy. And it says that ever since the beginning of creation, Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. They can only be changed from one form to another. So like if I said, make a gold atom, you can't do it. You can only get a gold atom from somewhere else and change it into another form. So all the atoms, all the matter that's around now has always been here ever since creation. Now, what about energy? Einstein, you might have heard of him, thought, had realized a formula, E equals mc squared, which is saying that there is a relationship between matter and energy, that matter can actually be changed into energy and theoretically energy back into matter, um, and that there's a relationship between these two. That's why it's not just, sometimes you see it just as the law of conservation of matter, sometimes you see it as the conservation of energy, but usually matter and energy because they have a dual nature. All right, now where did all this, let, let's talk about the history of chemistry. We've done this before a little bit, but remember I said it started with Democritus on the beach, figuring out Adams as a philosopher. Go Democritus. Then came the Middle Ages and the alchemist, and they were trying to turn, get rich. They were trying to turn um, lead to gold and things like that. And they kind of used witchcraft. So eh, we have a little bit of a dark history here or spells, but they also, they invented most of a lot of our lab techniques and most of our lab equipment. They, they came up with the, with, with the things that you think of as chemistry lab equipment. A lot of that they came up with and even techniques. So we do have a little bit of debt to pay to them. 
But the real study of chemistry didn't start until the 1700s. And remember I talked about John Dalton figured out the atomic theory of matter? Well, there was another guy too, and I'm sure I'm saying his French name perfectly since I don't know French, but it's Anton, Antoine, Anton Lavoisier. And I bet you don't say that air because you don't say half the consonants in French. But anyway, it looks like Anton Lavoisier. So, um, what he was a rich guy. Well, he didn't start off rich. He was a scientist. He was a clever guy. And he married a rich girl so that he could just devote his life to science. I'm sure he loved her too. And she also worked in his lab as a lab assistant. But they had plenty of money because they were French aristocracy. And they were able to devote their, their life to scientific discovery. And he discovered oxygen. And you're like, Pfft. I said, did I breathe that every day? <laughs> How did he discover this? They didn't know about it. They didn't know that oxygen was in the air you breathe. It had not been isolated. So he is really considered the father of chemistry. He started doing chemical experiments. And he really changed it from being alchemy into being a science. Now, it took a long time for chemistry to be accepted as a science. Uh, because physics is based on math very clearly. And when they, we first started learning chemistry, we didn't know the connection to math. So some of the um, early physicists were like, eh, that's not science. <laughs> but eventually it, it was accepted and it's very a very important branch of the physical sciences. Well, uh, is it good to be rich and part of the French aristocracy, uh, say right before the French Revolution? No, which always, have y'all ever heard of the thing about that Belle from Beauty and the Beast should have taken Gaston and not Beast because Beast was obviously French aristocracy and there's a, a, <laughs> there's a rebellion coming. There's the, the, the French Revolution. Well, um, Antoine Villavoisier, he saw the writing on the wall. He knew that he was probably going to get beheaded for being married to an aristocrat. And so he had his lab partner, who was a commoner. Um, he said, "I'm, you know, I'm going to get be killed. I'm going to be beheaded, Madame Guillotine. But um, I'll do one last experiment because I wonder how long your head is aware after it is severed from the body. So when I'm beheaded, I want you to run up and grab my head out of the ba basket, and I will blink at you very deliberately." as long as I'm still, you know, in my head and thinking and stuff. Can you believe that? And I think he blinked like 17 or 19 times very deliberately at his lab partner. One, I'm so impressed with the lab partner. I don't know that I can run grab the head of my friend out of the basket when he got beheaded. And, uh, and I'm so impressed with him. I mean, if I'm beheaded, I'm going to be panicking so much. I'm beheaded. I'm not so attached to my body anymore. That um, I don't think that I'm going to be thinking, i got to do my experiment. I'm going to blink at my lab partner very deliberately this many times. <laughs> the crazy stories of science. But how terrible. Absolutely, I'd say evil. I'm going to say evil. It was evil because they beheaded children and babies. And I'm just going to lay it out there and say, I think the French Revolution was evil. That's not how you solve political differences. Okay, but the sitting about politics is about science. Weirdly, it's connected there. Uh, they have a picture of him in the book, and it's not when he's beheaded. It's when he's in his lab. <laughs> Once he discovered oxygen, um, I had this little thing. He and his wife would partake of it regularly. They would like go on walks and take a little canister of oxygen and breathe it like how people who have emphysema have to do. They thought it was good for your health, and they didn't realize it was already in the air they were breathing. So, Anton Lavoisier, interesting fellow. Um, so, you can read a little bit about him. I don't think it talks about the beheading in the book. So, anyway, French Revolution, evil. All right, nomenclature. Um, we have talked, okay, so we talked about this a little bit, I think, at the very beginning of the year when we talked about metric system, but it is that we have international standards for communicating in science so that scientists can communicate all over the world without speaking the same language. So we have units and that are all the same. We have 
elements that are all the same on our periodic tables, and we have agreed upon rules of math and science that we all follow that is our international st standard, and including the names. The name, name fancy for name is nomenclature, and we have agreed upon names, nomenclature. And it's the, the governing body is the International Union of Pure and Applied Science, IUPAC. It is in France, because France, with Antoine de Boissier, was considered the center of um, academic learning uh, when, you know, in the 1700s. So it is still, everything's still in France, is the center of science. Now, um, writing equations. Let me, I'm going to write one for you. Let's see what I, yeah, we're good. And talk about that. We'll do this one. I want to go the other way. Doop, doop, doop. I need something to erase my board with. I had stolen my son Nathan's eraser. I guess it was on my desk. I don't remember doing it. But there's certainly circumstantial evidence that I'm guilty. All right. So say you want to make some water. Okay. How do you make water? Hydrogen gas. And hydrogen is diatomic. It means it hangs out as a pair if it's a pure gas. Plus oxygen gas, oxygen is diatomic. We talked about that last time, how oxygen can bond to itself in a double bond. Hydrogen bonds in a single bond. Makes water, H2O. So this is the recipe for water. And you're like, that's not a recipe. Where's the cups? Where's the teaspoons? Where's the tablespoons? This is the recipe. These are the reactants, that's the product. And if there's a condition to the reaction, it goes on top. So like if this was, I have a, a recipe for peanut butter cookies and it's one cup of peanut butter plus one cup sugar, and sugar is C6H12O6 plus one egg. And then I like to add a teaspoon of vanilla. We'll, we'll put that as a catalyst. For like 325 for about 10 minutes and add a teaspoon of vanilla. It makes one batch of cookies. So I used to do a thing where the kids could bring in some peanut butter cookies if they made them while they thought about how all cooking is chemistry and um, they could make up a lab or something. But now everybody's allergic to peanut butter. So last semester I did it, but I didn't let the kids eat the cookies. I, I just made them bring them so I could eat the cookies. But um, this time I was looking at my students and a bunch of them have peanut allergies. So I don't know that I'm gonna even bother doing it this time. But anyway, here's my recipe. Ingredients, products, conditions of reaction. So the condition of this reaction and the amounts are these big numbers on front, okay? Now, I'm going to get rid of my peanut butter cookie recipe. So, our, I don't have any numbers in front to be the amounts to put in, okay? So, how you get those numbers is you obey the law of conservation of matter, which is what you put in is what you get out. And if you look, I have two hydrogens I put in and two hydrogens I got out. But I put in two oxygens and only got out one. So this recipe is violating the law of conservation. How I'm going to fix it is by adding big numbers in front till they are, are right, till it obeys the law. Now you can never change the numbers on the bottom because then you'll have something else. Instead of water, you might have peroxide. And if you drink that, it'd kill you. So you, have to, you never can change the numbers on the bottom. Those are called subscripts. You can only change the big numbers that I'm going to write in front, which are called coefficients. And how you do it is you look. I have two hydrogens here. I look over here. I have two. Check. I'm obeying the law. I have two oxygens here and only one here. Ain't not obeying the law. So how I'm going to fix it is I'm going to write a big two in front. You're not allowed to put, change the, the subscripts and you're not allowed to insert numbers in the middle. Because what you're saying is, is I'm going to make two waters instead of one. But now that messed up my hydrogens because now I have two times two, which is four hydrogens over here. And here I only have two. So I have to go put it back and put a big two there. Now, um, so that tells me my amounts. Now I have my ingredients and I have no how many. I put two hydrogen molecules. So I'll draw them. One, two. And one oxygen molecule, I'll make it black. And then that makes 
two waters. A water, water looks like a Mickey Mouse. Oops, I did that the wrong color. That looks right. Okay. So now you can see that I followed the law of conservation mass. I start off with four white balls. Over here I got four white balls. I had two black balls. I have two black balls. Ta-da! We followed the law of conservation matter. We got the right number of elements. They are the right thing. I should have drawn that the oxygen has a double bond. I drew two bonds for oxygen. Now, now that's correct. Now, how do you, that doesn't say cups or tablespoons, so how do you convert that into something you actually can use? Well, that is something called stoichiometry and molar mass, and it's a little beyond the scope of this class. But just knowing chemistry, you'll learn how to change that into something you can weigh in grams or you can measure. So, um, now, the condition of this reaction is you have to shock it with electricity. And when you do, you make water. So, you can make some water by shocking those gases. Okay, like Frankenstein. Whoa! -ha -ha. All right, so we talked about all of this stuff. Read it in your book. Whatever your book is, read it and look at it and make sure you understand it. Now, there are different types of chemical reactions, okay? And, um, and I think the easiest way to remember them is I messed up my thing here, is um, romance. Romance, love, okay. So the first kind of reaction is where two things get together into one thing, and it is, and so this would be getting together. So we're gonna draw a little heart there. Yay, it's romantic, and it's called synthesis. Synthesis. You're making one thing out of two things, synthesis. Well, if couples can get together, what else can they do? They can break up. And actually, this can be written the other way. So if you have water and you break it up into oxygen and hydrogen, it's the opposite of synthesis. It is, we're going to draw a broken heart here because this is breaking up. See my little broken heart? This is called decomposition. Decomposition, breaking up. So when dead bodies decompose, they break up, right? You find an old squirrel in your yard or something. Decomposition. One thing broke up into many. Now, so we've got couples getting together, couples getting breaking apart. Well, sometimes it's not that easy, is it? Sometimes there's dun dun dun. This is a soap opera. An affair. Dun dun dun. All right. So let's see which one they draw for the. Uh, okay, that, they did this one. Okay, so you got copper plus silver nitrate, and then you have silver plus copper nitrate. And let's see, that's taken twice. And, doop. and that's all good. Okay, I'm not balancing it, but I can show you what happens. Okay, so here we had the happy couple. We had silver with nitrate. Nitrate's one of those polyatomic ions that they have covalent bonds between them, but they act as a, a, a anion. And okay, so they are all happy. But then here comes along good looking copper. Copper who is stronger than silver. And there are activity series charts where you can see who's stronger. And because copper is stronger than silver, he cuts in. And poor silver has to go off by himself. While co copper nitrate is the new couple. So this is called single replacement. And it is the affair. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so if there's single replacement, what else do you think there is? Double replacement. Let's see which, I'm going to get a real reaction to show you what double replacement is. Okay, let's see what which one they got. Uh, they just wrote it like that. That's kind of confusing. I'll just do it like this. I'll do A, B plus C, D yields A, D plus, wait a second, uh, uh, uh. sorry about that. A, yeah, I had it right. A, D plus uh, C, B. That's why I was writing wrong, C, B. Okay, because you're supposed to always write the same one in front and the same one in back. Okay, so here's here it is. We have two happy couples. We have A, B, that we're all happy, and C, D, that we're happy. But then A 
starts having an affair with D and they get together. Oh no, it's tragic. A and D are together now. So then what happens? So A and D are together. You see that? Well, so B and C, they go meet at Starbucks to talk about those no good, low down, dirty dog people that they used to be with. And then over Starbucks, the latte, love blooms. And then before you know it, CB is together. And it was funny. I taught this last semester. And one of my students said, that's what happened with my mom and stepdad. They, they both got, had an uh, affair uh, uh, done to them. They got together to talk about how awful those other people were. And now they're married. And they were like, they're happily married. And so see, it happens in chemicals and in real life. All right, so that one's double replacement. And then the last one is combustion. And combustion, it's a little controversial about the um, definition. One definition is if you have a hydrocarbon, something made of carbon and hydrogen, it combines with oxygen and it makes um, carbon dioxide and water. And that's what you're doing in your body right now. You don't have a little fire inside of you like a dragon, but chemically you ate breakfast. It was a hydrocarbon. You breathe in oxygen and then you breathe out carbon dioxide. And if you feel your breath, it's moist. So you're breathing out water too. So you do complete combustion. You do it with chemicals to burn the food up and you are amazing. You do it great. If it's incomplete combustion, it gives off smoke and ash. So if I was here to lighting that fire, it would be combustion, it would be burning the hydrocarbon, the wood, but it would give off smoke and you'd have ash and you'd have charcoal left over. And you would also have a poisonous gas called carbon monoxide given off that you always have to be real careful because if you breathe it, it will kill you. You hear about people dying from um, space heaters not working right or barbecue grills or exhaust from their car. All of that has the carbon monoxide in it that will kill you. Now, not carbon dioxide. If, and also when you breathe out, you also breathe out unused oxygen. If it was just carbon dioxide, mouth to mouth wouldn't work. You would just kill them faster. So um, you, you breathe out part carbon dioxide, but also part unused oxygen. All right, let's see. Anything else? So, oh, so why combustion is controversial. So that's what a lot of books have for combustion. There are other books that say any time that you're adding oxygen, that it is, um, it is combustion. So like the reaction between car exhaust and the oxygen in the air that produces pollution. In some books, I've seen that called combustion. So it just it's, it depends on which science nerd you're listening to. All right, now why do things undergo chemical reactions? Energy. It's always energy. It goes to a more stable form. Now sometimes it gives off energy, like burning that match. It's called exothermic. The energy is ex exiting. E and therm, thermic, that sounds like heat. The heat is exiting the reaction and it feels warm. Some reactions suck in heat and it's called endothermic and it feels cold. Now cold doesn't really exist. It's just a lack of heat, but it feels cold. So, you know, you, I used to be a baseball coach. I know, you're shocked. I am too. I was a batting coach, but I was also in charge of the first aid kit. And this was for boys, like 10, 12 year old boys. And they got hurt all the time. And we had cold packs in the first aid kit. And you break it, and then shake it, and it gets cold, and you put it on the injury. And we would go through those cold packs. We hardly ever used band-aids. The boys were like, eh, good enough. They didn't care if it was bleeding. But if it was, you know, sprained or something, they wanted that cold pack on it, and we would go through. So that would be an endothermic reaction. It's sucking the energy in. And either way, these chemical reactions are breaking and forming bonds, and it's said that they are more stable with energy. Now, there's a couple of other little things to know. Remember how I put the vanilla on the um, arrow? Sometimes with chemical reactions, you add a chemical to it that doesn't actually take place in the chemical reaction, but it helps it along. Now, I don't know if vanilla is or not. It probably takes place in the reaction. I don't know. But um, the other thing is you taste it and it's not changed. So that's why I'm thinking maybe it could be a catalyst or it could just be a 
ingredient. But these things, you add to it, it makes the reaction go without taking place, but it gets it together. In our bodies, we have enzymes that are proteins that do this, and they're really important. You wouldn't live without them. But also, the, a lot of times, platinum, some of these um, metals are used as catalysts. I always think about it with rock sugar. Did you ever do the lab where you take water and you add sugar and heat it up and heat it up and heat it up until it's got lots of melted sugar in it and then you put a string or a stick in it and the crystals will grow on the string or the stick so you've got your rock candy they sell it at six flags over near the sky buckets um in that store but and they make them different colors and sometimes they'll flavor them too but a lot of times it's just sugar on a stick well the stick is not taking place with the reaction but it's giving the crystals a place to grow the, so, so the stick's important. You want the stick for the crystals to grow on, but it's not really part of the candy. You eat, you eat the candy, you throw the stick away. So that's what catalysts are. They are things that help reactions, usually speeding them up. They don't really take place in the reaction, but they help the reaction go. They, they get it together. And in your body, what the enzymes do, the proteins, it'll, your body will, it'll, your, that protein enzyme will go off and get one chemical and then go get another one, stick them together for the reaction to happen. And you die without them, so extremely important. Um, I'll go ahead and tell y'all now, but I'll repeat it later. We are not going to do the whole book. I was looking at it compared to the Georgia Standards, and we are not going to do chapter 24 or 25, five organic compounds or new materials through chemistry. Um, they're not part of the normal scope of this class, but if you want to do those chapters, you read them and learn that stuff. But um, we are going to stop after 20, chapter 23, so that's two more videos. And if you're doing these one a week, you will finish early before the end of the year. But if you're using doing two a week, it'll probably end up being just about right. All right. So like, share, subscribe. Science is great. See you next time.